from Halmahara and Croeso. Welcome everyone um, to the Wales 2C um, event today. Um, our event is entitled Building Back Better, Making the Economy Work for Black Communities in Wales. Um, we have got a number of amazing speakers, uh, both from the trade union movement um, and more widely uh, from the community here in Wales, um, who are going to be talking about uh, their experiences, um, both from a worker perspective, but also from um, economic uh, perspectives as well, um, and some of the challenges that uh, some of the uh, some people have been facing um, in relation to keeping their businesses alive. We've also got lots of uh, entrepreneurs, people with new ideas and so forth, who will be talking um, a bit about their um, uh, businesses and projects as well. So it's, it's a real mix. Um, it's uh, first, uh, the first time we've done something like this, so, so please do bear with us. Um, I am going to uh, just run through a couple of formalities. Um, firstly, just to say we're going to be recording the event to be able to share it more widely after this event. Um, please read the code of conduct in the chat box, um, which should say we are committed to organizing activities in which everyone can, can participate in an inclusive, respectful and safe environment. Wales CBC has zero tolerance for any type of harassment, including sexual harassment, aggressive, offensive, intimidatory, disrespectful or un unacceptable behaviour or comments will not be tolerated. Your mic should be muted by default um, and I will call on the speakers to unmute their mics um, themselves when it's their turn to speak. We will be taking questions at the end, so please put your questions in the chat box. Um, uh, as you see, um, you can post them both in English or Welsh, um, so, so do do that. Um, before I introduce you to our first speaker, I should actually introduce myself. I just remembered, I didn't even say who I was. So um, I am Shivana Taj, I'm the General Secretary of the Wales TUC, um, and uh, so Croeso, welcome everybody. Um, and without further ado, because I'm looking at the clock, um, I want to introduce you to Nizreen Mansour, who is one of our Wales TUC policy officers. Nizreen is going to be setting the scene. Um, she's going to give you a bit of a feel for some of the economic factors in Wales, where we are, where some of the gaps are, as far as employment is concerned, um, and some wider issues as well. So I'm going to hand you over to Nizreen now. Thanks, Shav. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me a second. It should be straightforward. Has that worked? Yeah, great, thank you. I was expecting sound, and then obviously everyone's muted every time this happens. Um, so like Shav said, I'm just going to run through some of the um, kind of headline stats about BME workers in Wales. Um, I think it's uh, going to be a sort of a complement to lots of the experiences that we're going to hear about today. Um, let me just see how I actually click through the slideshow. There we go. Um, so I'm going to focus on where BME workers are, are based in Wales, uh, the sorts of jobs that they do, and their, uh, the level of inequality they face in terms of pay, uh, how that links with discrimination and exclusion from the labour market as well, and then uh, a brief bit about BME workers and trade unions. Um, I just want to say a few things about this though. Um, so it's data from other sources. So some of the language and the groupings that are used by um, some of the ways that stats are officially collected might not always be language that we're comfortable with. And that it's just, it's just data, it's just averages and stats. And, um, you know, for lots of us, I think it can feel like quite an establishment way to look at some of these issues. Um, so it, it focuses on what's easy to measure, so things like pay and not necessarily, you know, how things affect us emotionally. So I just want to kind of add those caveats in from the start. So this is a, a bit of a, a, a timeline of uh, employment rate by ethnicity in Wales. It's very headline. Um, it shows the gap between BAME workers and white workers in Wales and the employment rate for those, for those two groups. 
Um, and I think it doesn't it doesn't show us a great deal because I think a lot of the the more kind of interesting significant information sits underneath this data. But it does show that there's been a persistent gap between the employment rate for white workers and BAME workers in Wales um, so since the data has been recorded. And I think that gap is, is around sort of 10 percentage points and it's not really narrowing either. Uh, this is a horrible chart, sorry. I, it's, it's very difficult to get complex stuff like this looking nice. And this shows occupation by ethnicity. So it looks at uh, particular groups of workers uh, based on which occupation they fit in and their ethnic background. I've highlighted a couple of stats there because this is where we start to see how uh, where people are in the labour market has a big impact on their pay and their risk of being in poverty. So it shows that black workers are a much higher chance of being in caring, leisure and other service activities. And then we see other groups of workers, so people from Indian and, and other Asian backgrounds more likely to be in professional occupations, which again can have a big impact in terms of their likelihood of being in lower or higher pay. And then I think more relevant to our movement is which industries people fall in, because when we look at where uh, people are more likely to be in a unionised work environment, that tends to be more down to which industry they're working in. And again, we see, uh, you know, kind of industry gaps between different ethnic groups so people from Asian, Indian and Pakistani and Bangladeshi backgrounds are more likely to be working in transport and communication industries and then uh, people from a black background are more likely to be in public administration, education and health so we see kind of gaps emerging like that which which I think is a good indicator for how likely somebody is to be in an industry with fairer work or not. Uh, this chart shows uh, the different pay, the, the likelihood of being in a low pay uh, role based on your ethnicity. So we know that there is a, a gender pay gap in the UK and pay is obviously a key measure of, of work, of the quality of work. But I think this chart is more useful to consider than simply the kind of headline uh, pay gap between um, white workers and BME workers um, because I think it's that bit on towards the right of your screen where it shows the risk of being in the uh, in lower pay that really uh, gives us an idea of, of why BME workers and BME workers from certain backgrounds are more likely to be in much lower paid roles so I think particularly Pakistani, Bangladeshi and black workers are at a far higher risk of being in low pay and it's it's not it's also clear that not all uh, BME workers experience lower pay on average. So I think it's important to recognise that people from different BME backgrounds have very different experiences. Um, and there's a bit of hope as well, because when this data is broken down by age group, um, there's a smaller pay gap for younger workers. And it's also interesting that once occupation and education are taken into account, so once people's formal qualification levels are considered, um, there's actually a, a, a much smaller gap between BME and white workers. Uh, however, that gap does remain quite wide when you consider if somebody was born in the UK or not. So once you start to look further and further into the data, you realise that actually it's incredible, like people's experiences based on their ethnicity and where they were born present a really, really complex picture about uh, the experiences of BME workers in Wales. I just wanted to touch on intersectionality a bit because that's something that, that we try to, to really take into account in lots of our equality work at the Wales TUC. And um, these two charts just show that uh, women in almost uh, all ethnic groups are at greater risk of lower pay. And uh, lots of the research shows that there's, there's like a compounding effect when it comes to discrimination. Um, so particularly when you take into account things like ethnicity and disability together, somebody's risk of being in a poor quality job or from being excluded from, from the jobs market altogether are much, much greater. So we can't just look at one aspect of, of someone's characteristics in isolation without considering other risk factors as well. And it's not just about, I think, discrimination or inequality within the workplace. It's also about the fact that being pe people are at greater risk of being unemployed. They're at greater risk of being in that category called uh, economically inactive, which is a horrible term because people aren't inactive at all. They're just 
often not able, well, they don't even feel like they're able to look for work. Um, so it indicates that um, there is a very high level of, of discrimination, I think, that's, that's keeping a lot of people even out of the labour market, and we need to address that. And uh, BME people uh, are much greater risk of uh, things that we all recognise as being really like bad quality employment or unfair practices. So TUC research on uh, BME workers experience has shown that they're twice as likely to be stuck on an agency contract, which comes with lots of issues around poor quality work. Uh, one in 13 are in temporary work, which compares to one in 19 um, white workers and uh, BME people are much more likely to be on a, a, a zero hours contract as well. Um, we're always interested in poor quality work and uh, low pay and, and job insecurity in relation to poverty. Um, and the, the data around and the research on, on poverty and BME communities in Wales is fairly limited, um, which is you know, something that we, we'd be looking to address along with lots of other organisations who are present here today. But the research has shown that the link between uh, ethnicity and the work that people from BME backgrounds do is absolutely critical in determining their risk of being in poverty. So just to touch quickly on uh, ethnicity and trade union membership, again these are national stats so these are all classifications uh, used by the ONS. Um, I think it's a really complex story. Uh, so I think overall BME workers remain underrepresented in our movement. Um, that's both in terms of membership, but also in terms of positions, whether it's voluntary positions or officer positions. I think lots and lots of work is happening within the movement to try and address that and has been for many years. That's through things like setting up committees, um, through uh, training programmes specifically to bring BME people up through both voluntary roles and the professional roles within the union. But I think there's still lots more that can be done. Um, I think it's, again, it's interesting that um, people born outside the UK are less likely to be a union member than somebody born in the UK. So there's clearly stuff that we need to do to reach out to people. And there's obviously that tension between what we do, which is around the collective voice of the workforce and trying to represent minority voices that we always have to try to, uh, to work through. And I think that's through having really active BME memberships and also making sure that our movement becomes as representative as it can be. Just to touch quickly on the work that we've been doing through the crisis. Um, so we've recently published a guide on uh, COVID-19 for BME workers. Um, obviously, we're all aware of the increased risk that many BME workers and BME people face in relation to the virus. And so this guide talks through some of the steps about how you can work safely and what you need to do if you don't feel like you can be safe at work. Um, we've also published a survey as well, um, again, because you know, we want to hear from as many BME workers as possible about their experiences of working through this crisis, how they felt they've been protected, what more can be done. And uh, Wales TUC works in social partnership with Welsh Government and employers to, uh, to use all the policy levers that we've got here in Wales to, to try to work through some of the challenges. And that includes the experience of BME workers through this crisis. So we've worked with government on things like a risk assessment for BME workers. Um, but again, you know, we want to hear from you to find out what more we can be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nisreen. I think um, I can see lots of people are requesting your presentation. So, so good job there. Um, as Nisreen says, I mean, you know, these are figures and it is important for us to not just look at raw data, but to understand the stories and the reasons behind um, some, of, some of the figures that we see in front of us. So I'm hoping that today, um, through our speakers, we will get a better understanding of what some of the, the barriers and some of the challenges are, but also how we can you know, um, tactically uh, organize to overcome some of these barriers and some of these issues. So next up, um, we have Keba Mane. He is the chair of the National and Welsh Unison Black Members Committee. And he is gonna be speaking to us today about the challenges facing black workers in Wales 
and how we can dismantle and overcome these forces. So Keba, I hope you are on the line and you can come in. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon all. Thank you, Savannah, for those kind words. I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, uh, uh, for um, <clears throat> your introduction and for the kind way the audience have received me. As you said, I was asked to present a broader overview on the real challenges and barriers facing black workers in Wales and how we organize to take on the systematic institutional structural racism in Wales. Perhaps if I can quickly explain why we use the term black in unison with capital B to our audience. In unison, the term black is a political and inclusive sense to describe people in Britain that have suffered colonialism and enslavement in the past and continue to experience systemic institutional structural racism uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the workplace, communities and society across UK. It is not the description of the color of our skins, nor our ethnicity. For further information on this, you can find it at unison.org.uk. To what extent does the real challenges and barriers facing black workers in Wales, the starting point, perhaps, the COVID-19 has shined a bright spotlight on the devastating reality of how black people are being treated in Wales and across UK. It's worth noting that black people and black organizations in Wales in the past or now, no longer have to be worried or fearful about speaking out in case the Wales government withdraw their funding. That used to be the case uh, and, and also the control mechanism in the Wales government based on experience as the chair of, or has used to be the chair of Southeast Wales Racial Equality Council. We've experienced it. The brutal reality of COVID-19 has exposed the entrenched ways racism affects where you live and how you work. It affects health and well-being. It affects, it affects access to healthcare and housing. Our economy relies on an army of invincible workers, high proportion of whom are black workers and who have come to the fore to save lives and keep society functioning. The exposure of occupational segregation, fragmented employment, zero hour contract, privatization, cuts, poverty, lack of PPE and lack of sick pay is therefore no surprise. Added to this is many black workers fear that raising concerns with managers will only make their situation worse. For example, the migrant workers who have told me across the country from Northern Ireland to Abakaveni, they are fearful of losing their jobs as their employment status was a condition attached to the visa work permit whose loss will automatically activate their administrative removal from the home office or by the home office from the UK to their country of origin. Not many people know that. I didn't know that until I was contacted by our members across the UK as the chair of the National Black Members Committee. The stat statistics is official, is official reports of those who catch COVID-19 and the disproportionate death rate of black workers and their families are shocking to read. We welcome Professor Ogbonna's report of the COVID-19 and the impact on black people and black community. And with more than 30 recommendations, it must be implemented immediately. We must organize and demand black people to be employed as chief executive officers in our local authorities. We've got 22 local authorities in Wales with no black chief executive officer. We've got eight local health boards with the same 
for police force, no chief constable from the black community. In fact, there are no single black chief executive officer in any of our public sector or indeed universities. We are clear it did not happen by accident, but it was systematically institutionally structured in workplaces, society, and across Wales. We do not want middle-class white privileged person to speak for us no longer, and we will speak for ourselves. And the starting point with that will be reinstating the black person to be the head of the equality unit of the Wales government as it was originally intended during uh, the installation in the Wales Government of Wales Act 2006, it is stated in it that we must give due regards to black and minority ethnic people in those days, they call us that. And we raise a concern as the chair of Southeast Wales Race Security Council and with other uh, executive member for CIREC, Vanessa Cyril's OBE, we present to the Wales government that we haven't got any representation in the Wales government and therefore the only way to come round that at the time was to create a specific unit that will speak to protect and advance the interests of black people and hence a chap called Charles Willey was the head of that unit until what happened happened not going to history. The point I'm making is that we need to demand to get back to that original state to make so that unit functioned properly because it was established under the Government of Wales Act in 2006. And without the Government of Wales Act, there will be no Wales Parliament as we know it today. I was there, like many of other people on this uh, forum. The, is, the reality is we have to take control. Black people have to speak for themselves. We do not need people to speak for us. We do not need, you know, a white privileged person who never experienced systematic institutional racism to speak for us. And that's why we are where we are last 20 years or so. Savannah, I could go on and on, but I know you keep looking and maybe perhaps I've run out of time. I'll hold my thoughts for now, and I'm happy to take questions in relation to what I said about we regaining control and power. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keba. We will be taking um, questions um, at the end of the session, and I'm sure loads of people are going to have questions for you. Um, I am going to move on actually uh, there was just one point i wanted to make quickly and that is is that we do now finally have one um one bme um one bme director of an organization for the for the boundary commission um shireen williams um who i think is on the call today she is one of our audience participants but she's one and we need, you know, we need many more. And that's taken so long to happen in the first place. So, so it's good, but we need plenty more. So just to, just to flag that. Okay, thank so thank you. Thank you, Keba. Um, next, I am going to be um, asking Taranjit Chenna, who is the GMB National Race Lead, um, to, to speak. She is going to be speaking about the exploitation of black workers yeah. and organizing for change. And I'm really happy that she's been able to join us. So over to you. Thank you. I just want to thank Wales TUC in hosting this event, uh, and in particular Karen Brady of the GMB, and also Shav Taj, who we know is the first black woman of South Asian heritage to be general secretary, as far as I know, of Wales TUC. And that's the big up, basically. And it's, it's an honour as a black lesbian of South Asian heritage and a staunch trade unionist to be on this plan platform. And we really need to be celebrating those wins. Um, they're very few in between, but you know, we have a history. And I also want to take this platform <clears throat> to remember um, Nita Sangera. Nita Sangera, unfortunately, we lost at the beginning of this year, and she would have been the first black uh, Asian president, first black president of the UCE Union. And it's really important that we, 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 we honor that. Um, exploitation of black workers organizing, organizing, organizing for change. I was trying to say that. 
So despite our history uh, of involvement in the labour movement and in the trade union movement, as black workers we continue to be exploited. It's black workers who are the ones on the receiving end and feel the brunt of zero hour contracts that's been mentioned, low wages, in unskilled jobs, <clears throat> you know, highly skilled migrant workers who are highly qualified, highly skilled, they find themselves in positions that are not akin uh, and reflect that. And also I think someone mentioned about the ethnicity and race pay gap. Now any audits or findings of that are basically going to demonstrate and show exactly this exploitation, no matter what level of work that you're in. And it's not just the economical um, exploitation as black workers and can I just say as black workers I use the term black I know a lot of people use BAME people of colour BME absolutely fine wherever is comfortable for you but I'm from an era which my uh, comrade mentioned um, that black is a uniting force it's a political term so that's what I'll be using and again it's um, as I was saying you know it's not just find economical exploitation as black workers, it's the emotional and societal exploitation as black workers. The human cost of having to do jobs that are not akin to our skills, to both socially, and also the everyday racism that we face, the in-your-face racism at work, and the institutional and structural racism that we face. Um, and on our streets as well, I mean, I'll give you an example, COVID-19, these emergency measures that were put in place with no one knowing in Harringay for instance stop and search pre-COVID-19 600 stop and search that have been, that have been recorded during COVID-19 1500 and rising and of those stops and searches of young black men 95% are let off so there's no arrests so can you imagine as a black worker going to work on your way to work being stopped and searched under COVID-19 then let go, then, you know, nothing's happened, you're not arrested, you're not charged, and then you have to go to work. Where do we as black workers, where do we hold that? You know, the emotional impact of being exploited is huge as it affects our body, mind and soul. And yeah, we are less likely to have access to clinical supervision, for example, in some workplaces, and also occupational therapy, you know, and there's historical reasons for that, and 400 years plus historical reasons. Equally historically, we also have to see how black workers have organised. And in 1936 in Cardiff, um, black workers formed um, Coloured Seamen's Union. Now this was a group of Arabs, Malays, African, Caribbean workers who basically were um, got together uh, to fight against the colour bar at the Cardiff docks, a self-organised group. And we also have the Bristol bus strikes uh, in Bristol, which was inspired by Rosa Parks, where Asian and black bus drivers uh, went on strike. Recently, we have Gate Gourmet, um, Sky Chefs, Medirest. So these are um, low paid workers, cleaners, porters in hospitals, um, St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. You also have the Ministry of Justice, where you have the um, um, cleaners, the security guards, all self organizing, self organizing on a grassroots level um, because of the failure of movements to effectively take up the issues that affect us that in the workplace. And why do we self organize? We self organize for those exact reasons. And I'll just finish uh, this um, by a quote by Jabin Desai, who was the leader of the greatest strike, I believe, by migrant workers, by immigrant workers in the 70s, the Grunwick dispute in Northwest London. And what she said when they reached at the end, I mean, she led 20,000 unions, dockers, miners, everyone came out, women's organizations came out on the streets. And this was in the uh, TUC headquarters at the end where um, they had a uh, sit-in. What began as a fight for union recognition has ended up with us challenging our own unions. And I think that's really important because the moral victory had been won. I believe the moral victory was won with, current, with the Grumwick dispute. And these were migrant workers, not just fighting for themselves, but were fighting for pay, conditions, etc., for all workers. So I think it's really important as black workers, we don't just fight for black workers, right? We fight for all workers. So thank you. 
Thank you so much, sister. It is brilliant to have you uh, have you join us, and I hope you can stay till the end because, like I say, we are going to be taking some questions there. But loads of food for thought, and as you say, it's really important for us to talk about our history as a trade union movement, and you know how black people have uh, featured in some you know really important important moments for the for the trade union movement as well. Just to say the trade union movement doesn't always get it right either we have a lot to grow and, and learn from as well we don't always get it right but it's you know it's really good that there are so many of us who, who continue um on with these battles and and you know uh the you know and the fact that we do um stand on sh you know shoulders of giants others that have come before us and and others who will come after us so thank you so much for that um next up um we have um Roger McKenzie, who is the Unison Assistant General Secretary. Uh, many of you uh, will know Roger for lots of different reasons, uh, but I know uh, Roger as um, I started, uh, I came into the TUC actually through the Organising Academy. Um, I was a couple of weeks into my role and something went wrong and I'd heard Roger speak before that at lots of different events as a, as a uh, not long before that, uh, particularly during the time when we were organizing um, when Stephen Lawrence uh, was killed. And Roger was really at the forefront of all of that. And I was kind of like inspired by this, by this person. And then um, something went wrong. And I knew at that time that he was the TUC um, National Equality Officer. And I just rocked up at the TUC and refused to move until he came down to meet me. And they, they, he did and the rest is history. So I've known Roger for a very long time. So I'm really glad that he's been able to join us. So, so Roger, um, over to you. And uh, the title of your, uh, your talk is on organizing a show of slavery. So I hope that you can hear me and you're able to join. I can, Th thank you, thank you, Shab. Um, really lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for that. And um, can I thank you for all that you do um, for our movement. You're, you're an absolute inspiration to lots of trade unionists um, across the country. I think you do an absolutely fantastic um, job. And can I thank everybody for being um, on this call as well today. Um, 99 people on this call on a Friday afternoon. So can somebody ring up one other person at least and try and get it to, to the magic hundred? I think that would be... Um, uh, there we go. 101. Fantastic. Who's been on? Someone's been on the phone. Excellent. That's fantastic. Um, so there I was yesterday, minding my own business, um, and I thought, right, it's time to, to look at my Twitter account and see what's going on. And then I saw the, um, something was trending um, on Twitter, and it said, uh, I thought it says Starsky. So I thought, I'm showing my age here a little bit. So I thought, Starsky and Hutch, something's happened to Starsky. And, and actually, when I looked properly, it was Starkey. And it was this so-called professor who decided to um, diss black, black people everywhere by basically saying it couldn't have been a Holocaust that our ancestors had been involved in because um, too many damn blacks apparently survived. How insulting is that? The good news is, folks, is that he's lost a load of jobs today. He's lost his job at Cambridge, he's lost his job at Canterbury, his publishing company is telling him that they're going to review um, all his back catalogue. This is great news, right? But the problem is, is that his sort of attitudes are not just with some right wing political or intellectual elites. His views sprinkle right down into workplaces as well and right down into communities. And we all know that because we suffer the consequences of people like that. You know, we see these big name people going, um, starting with the, um, the current occupant of the White House, all the way through to the current occupant of 10 Downing Street, through to people like Starkey, coming out with their views. And they think that it's all right from the comfort of their um, rich homes. We bear the consequences in the workplace because people then mimic what those folks say. And, and it hurts us, not just physically, when people decide to attack us in the workplace or attack us in the streets, but it hurts us mentally as well. And that's why this in the shadow of slavery phrase 
is I think so important because people don't realize the impact that all of these hundreds of years of accumulated um, uh, dissing of black people, what that actually does to us, what that actually means, the impact that that actually has on not just us, but what they really don't realize is the impact that it has on them. Because what it also does is it stops them from succeeding um, in workplaces when they say to us as black people that we're somehow inferior because they fall for the biggest lie of all. They fall for this line that um, somehow they're superior for us and that they'll get on on their own. And we all know that when we are divided as working people, we get nothing. We achieve nothing. We always, always, always lose. So the only thing that matters from now on is what are we prepared to do about this? Because we all know these issues. It's not secret. Um, report after report after report has been written about what's been taking place for black people. There's no shortage of stats, as you've already heard um, from the brilliant participants that we've already had on this call. There's no shortage of stats. Everybody knows what the issues are. We have conferences after conferences after conferences. We have reports of the conferences. We have books of the conferences. We have films of the conferences. We have everything about the conferences. The issue is, is what are pe when are people going to do something about these issues that we have been talking about for far too long? Because I don't know about the rest of you. In fact, I'll make an educated guess that the rest of you feel exactly the same as I do, because I'm fed up of this now. I'm fed up of having to go to conference after conference and say the same thing time and time again, knowing full well that nobody's going to do anything about it. So I've come to this startling conclusion, right? And actually, it's not so startling conclusion because we all know this to be true. And Taranjit has just confirmed it, that we have to be prepared to stand up and do stuff ourselves. We can't rely on anybody else doing this stuff for us as good-willed as some people might be, because I also don't want people talking on my behalf. I don't want people filtering what I've got to say, and I don't want people to think that they know how I feel and that they know the things that my family, my ancestors, and, and myself, that we've all been through. They don't, right? What they need to do is listen to what we've got to say. And the beauty of this gathering today it is an opportunity for folks to listen to what we have to say as black people. That's the beauty of it. Not just to listen, but to act on what it is that we're talking about, because that's the critical thing. You can talk about this stuff forever, but are we prepared, are people prepared to do something, actually do something about the discrimination that we face? And that's why I want to welcome um, the TUC's um, commitment to, do a, to have another task force um, to, to deal with um, racism, um, not just um, within our ranks, as important as that is. Years ago, I was the secretary of the TUC Stephen Lawrence Task Force, but not just looking internally about what we do, and there's plenty that we do need um, to do um, as a movement, but looking at what else needs to be done um, across the communities, across society as well. So it can't be just a tick box exercise from the trade union movement, as it can't be a tick box exercise from all of these organizations that are responding to Black Lives Matters in the way that they are now. Because I tell you, we've all seen this before as well, where what they do is they come up with short term, quick fix solutions um, to the sort of things that we have been talking about that we all know requires systemic change um, to society. So in the end, um, whatever task force is set up, whatever trade unions do, whatever employers do, whatever government of whatever country decides to do, it's good, it, people will be judged now on progress. People will be judged on not what they say, but what it is they actually do. That's going to be the test. And we are watching everybody right now. So little gestures of putting your hands up, gestures of going on your knees, little gestures of applause um, at eight o'clock of a night. All of those things are nice, but they don't put bread on the table and they don't stop discrimination from taking place. What stops those things from happening is us together standing up, straightening our backs, lifting our heads and standing up and organizing collectively together. Thanks very much for listening. 
Thank you so much. Always inspirational and, you know, always just on point. And um, I'm, there's, there's so many different comments that are coming up as they were for the previous speakers as well. But yeah, organizing is key. And, you know, that is, I'm hoping, part of the conversations that have been taking place recently, we do really need to think about how we organize collectively and how we support one another. And as you say, stand up strong together. So thank you, Roger. Um, I hope you can stay until uh, towards the end um, so that we can take some questions. If people can keep posting in the questions, that would be great. Um, the other thing that I wanted to quickly um, mention um, that I think I forgot to say is if people are um, needing to see, uh, one second, I have a message here. Um, right, so we have got captions available. So if people need to um, need captions, um, if you click the CC closed captions at the bottom of your screens, you should be able to, to see what's, you know, what's actually being said in terms of text. So if you're in a you know, noisy environment or for, for another reason you need it, that is available to you. So, so please do use that. Um, it is that service is available for, for the rest of this session, for the entire session, actually. So um, next up, um, I will be introducing um, Ken Skates, who is the Economy and Skills Minister. Um, Ken has, uh, Ken is someone who we at the TUC and Trade Union Movement are talking to on a regular basis. He is the, as I say, he's the Economy and Skills Minister. Um, but he is specifically very focused and very keen on, you know, when we talk about building back better for Wales, what does that actually mean? And we've been having lots of conversations recently about, um, you know, the socioeconomic factors, where the gaps are, what the problem areas are, and how do we overcome some of the systematic institutional uh, barriers um, that, you know, we really do need to, to tear down. And I'm hoping that Ken can speak for a short while um, and then we can go on to, to the rest of our amazing speakers because, you know, what Ken made quite clear was that he wanted to listen today. So that was important. So I'm going to um, introduce Ken and I hope that he is available. And if I mute myself, he's going to be able to, to come on. Thanks, Shavanna. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I, I'm really nervous about following Roger. That was one hell of a presentation. Um, and I'm going to be touching on a few of the points that Roger um, raised and some of the things that he alluded to, because it does go to the heart what he was saying of why we want to build back better. Now, I'm going to be uh, tag teaming with one of my colleagues this afternoon, Jane Hutt, who will be uh, joining us around about five o'clock. Um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about what the government is intending to do with the economy in the weeks, months and years to come, because there is a huge opportunity to address imbalance and inequality across Wales within communities as well. Um, before we went into coronavirus in Wales, we had achieved a record low level of unemployment, um, a record low level of economic inactivity, a record number of businesses, uh, productivity that was, that was improving here in Wales uh, at a faster pace than it was across the UK. And the proportion of people without any qualifications had halved. Uh, between 1999 and 2019. But the fact of the matter is that we went into coronavirus with some entrenched, deep, difficult structural problems still existing, which meant that the fruits of growth and success had not been shared equally across society. The reason is quite simple. The political economy of Wales and of the UK and of much of the globe is still too white too middle class, it's too middle aged, it's too biased in favour of people and places that are already powerful and affluent. So is it any wonder that we end up with rich racists in power in some countries? Is it any wonder? Because the system is skewed in favour of them and has been for too long. So as, as Roger alluded to, change is only going to come by changing the political economy that is supposed to serve us all, but clearly does not. It's about taking control of the system. And that's not just taking control of uh, governments, of the political proce process. It's also about, as Shavanna has demonstrated, about taking control, leading union movements, leading in business, leading across society. 
and making sure that, as again, as Roger said, at every opportunity you show that you are here, that you are going to stand for something that is better than we have had to tolerate for years and years and years, and nobody is going to retreat from that campaign. So that's what I mean by building back better after COVID. It's about changing the entire system. It's about leveling up, not just across regions and communities, but across every single demographic in society. Now, we're going to focus our efforts in Welsh Government on four key themes in striving to achieve a better society, a better outcome for people. Those four key areas will concern investing in a green recovery, um, a digital recovery, but crucially, I think, a people-led recovery and a recovery that ensures that those places that were already struggling and in many cases left behind before coronavirus are not left to further wither. So when we look at people, what we're going to do on the people front, there's going to be a huge intervention in terms of skills training. Um, we're going to be looking at how we can support people into business, developing their business, uh, developing their careers within business through Business Wales and other support systems like Working Wales. But we've got to accept that right now, at this very moment in time, there are huge, huge disadvantages that are facing some people. Young people under 25s represent about 12% of the workforce in Wales, but they represent 25% of the workforce in those sectors that have had to shut down because of coronavirus. And therefore, young people are far more likely to suffer from job losses over the coming weeks and months. And the same statistics apply to minority ethnic people, to women, to the disabled, and to people with lower levels of skills. And that's why I'll unashamedly be prioritizing funding for people who are already suffering from disadvantage and making sure that it's not about creating a, a step up. It's about making sure that we empower people, that people are noticed, that people are given all of the support in every single way that's required. Now, we set up Working Wales about a year ago, and Working Wales is a single, single point of contact for anybody that wants um, employment advice, support, skills training. The reason that we set it up was because I was finding time and time again, the people who were struggling to get by in life were struggling not because of just a lack of opportunity to get into work, but because of other challenges. For example, in the area of Wales that I live in, one in five young people one in five can't even get the job interviews because they can't get public transport to get the job interviews. So a major barrier that we needed to overcome for many people was access to affordable, available public transport. Mental health support as well, recognizing we have an epidemic in terms of anxiety levels, in terms of depression. You know, there are huge numbers of people as a result of coronavirus who perhaps only ever experienced low levels of uh, mental illness who are now suffering very, very much. And as we emerge from coronavirus, the effects and mental and emotional effects of the pandemic will not suddenly evaporate. So there is no doubt that further support will be required in terms of mental health and emotional health. And then there will also be um, help required in busting through doors, in breaking down access uh, barriers to employment for people the demographics who I'm, whom I've already identified. And we, what we'll be doing um, to achieve that is we'll be focusing our funding on Jobs Growth Wales programmes and apprenticeship programmes in a way that balances out opportunities in society more fairly. Now, Jobs Growth Wales, for anyone who doesn't, isn't familiar with the scheme, it was developed after the financial crisis. And um, at the time that we developed this as a Welsh government, the UK government, the new government that was elected in 2010 under uh, David Cameron coalition government, they, they got rid of the Future Jobs Fund, which was aimed at keeping young people in work and getting young people back into work as soon as possible to avoid long term unemployment. And we succeeded in getting tens of thousands of young people into work, whereas they would otherwise have suffered from long term unemployment. And all of the consequences are very clear now. All of the evidence shows that if you're young and you suffer from a long period of unemployment, you are far less likely to get into work within five years of um, suffering six months of uh, unemployment. You are far more likely to suffer from long-term mental and emo emotional 
health issues and you're far more likely to suffer from um, health issues as well. And as a result of those interventions, I live in Wrexham, uh, just outside Wrexham, where we had uh, a rise of about 50% in long-term youth unemployment, still too high, but it was about 50% within a few miles of Chester over the border. There, long-term youth unemployment was 300%. It rose by 300%. So that intervention is proven to work. And we will be using that, the apprenticeship, apprenticeship system, every other employability uh, program to give people the chances that are so desperately required. But ultimately, an economy is shaped by those in charge of it in a way that reflects their values. And if you want to see systemic change to the political economy that operates, you have to either take control through being elected or in business, or you have to make sure that you lead in whatever uh, field of life that you operate in. And just one final point, and this, this is about what sometimes, sometimes people say, a job's a job. It doesn't matter about what you do with the economy as long as, long as you're creating jobs. Quality of jobs matter. What people are paid matters. How people are treated matters. What sort of skills people are picking up in the workplace matters. And that's why we will be strengthening and enhancing and broadening the use of the economic contract right across the Welsh economy, making sure that any business that wants support from the taxpayer through Welsh Government, and I hope not just in terms of direct support, but through the procurement system as well, will have to sign up to the economic contract that requires a business to show how they are decarbonising, how they are working to fair work principles and fair work policies, how they're investing in the mental health and skills of the workforce, and how they're contributing to fair growth, inclusive growth. And we will apply this contract right across business. So I hope that gives a broad outline of what we're trying to achieve in, through the Welsh Government in terms of the recovery from coronavirus. And I know that uh, Jane Hutt will be with us a little later as well. Right. Shivana, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ken. Um, I just wanted to um, say um, some of the um, some of the stuff that you referred to, um, some of the links have been posted up in the sidebar as well for those people um, who may be wondering um, some of the schemes that Ken was making reference to. Um, so whilst we've got you here, Ken, we've got a number of really good speakers. So if I, um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker. Um, Hurum Chowdhury is the director of Goldwater. He is uh, uh, Goldwater IT Recruitment Solutions. And he is going to be speaking about the barriers to building Bain Tech talent communities in Wales. So over to you, Hurum. Hi. Uh, thank you, Shivana. Thank you, Wales TUC. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to... Um, follow on from, from Ken and, and Roger, um, but uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today anyway. Um, I, I'll try and be as concise as I can in talking you through my own personal experience, uh, as I know we can all get a little bit carried away when discussing our personal journey, so it should be about six or seven minutes. I promise it won't be war and peace. I, I'll save that for uh, when lockdown is over and if anybody wants to take me for a coffee. Um, so just a quick background. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am or where I come from, uh, I was born, raised, uh, and went to university here in Cardiff, so a Welshman through and through. Uh, I set up and, and run one of the largest basketball clubs in Wales, uh, Cardiff City Basketball. Uh, I'm also the owner of uh, Goldwater IT Recruitment. Uh, we've just entered our third year of business uh, in the last two weeks, uh, and I'm the first and only Asian IT recruitment business owner in Wales. Uh, so that's just tying into what Nasreen mentioned earlier as, as it's a little crazy uh, considering 20% of the UK's entire IT workforce is from an Asian background. Um, I'm not sure if that was in the stats that Nasreen mentioned, but I, I, I had to dig that one out actually from the government website. Um, in terms of Goldwater, we built up a, a self-funded internship scheme uh, specifically focused on young people from a BAME or, or a, well, a BAME and a disadvantaged background. Uh, it's worked out really well. One of the chaps still actually works with us. Uh, we offer IT recruitment solutions to large financial services, multinationals and tech startups, 
So, so developers, engineers, first line support, project managers, uh, data analysts, and, and everything in between. Um, myself, I've, I've been actually in recruitment for over a decade and in the top 1% in my industry. Um, the reason I mention this is, is not to be braggadocio, but to highlight that I am qualified and, and, and I know a little bit about the rapidly changing nature of the tech industry and how it cannot exist without recruitment companies such as Goldwater. Um, at the start of our journey, we needed advice, I'm going to be honest, uh, and a little guidance. Um, there were a few things that we didn't know, such as things like what business rates were and how charming HMRC can be if you forget to file on time. Um, other little things most people pick up in business school or is passed down as you work your way up through a company, I didn't really have that opportunity. Um, for me, there seemed to be very little support for new SMEs in the tech space, uh, especially if you're from an Asian background. Um, a few of the, 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 the quangos or a few of the organizations can mention. Um, I was told categorically in 2018, now um, my toughest year, uh, no grants were available um, and that uh, we were not eligible for any Bank of Wales equity schemes. Uh, we were even turned down and ignored by Business Wales, uh, where there was almost a two month wait in between an email and a phone call. Uh, at the same time, we saw several large tech companies get Welsh government help but no tech recruitment companies, which was kind of odd because we knew the, that the old recruitment companies were falling or failing in moving with the times, to be honest, and uh, delivering on, on finding good candidates. Uh, essentially, you cannot have a successful tech hub as, as we're trying to do in Cardiff, and I know that's a big drive for the Welsh Government, if you don't have great tech recruiters. Uh, take a look at Silicon Roundabout in London, for example. Um, but all the work seemed to go towards the established larger, English-owned, white-dominated companies. Um, you, you're probably saying now, yes, but what has this got to do with you being a Bain business owner? Well, essentially, if the person who is hiring is from one pool and the people looking for candidates are from the same pool, what are the chances you're going to get someone outside of that pool? You can only get the best talent if you have all the options available to you. I think what could have been easier for us was speaking to somebody that was willing to sit down, you know, either at our office or go for a coffee with ourselves and talk through the logistics of running a business in Wales. Someone who could plug us into other Welsh bred or Welsh government invested companies that could utilize our service. And then as we develop, we could utilize their service. It's pretty simple economics. It's like the farmers keep saying, buy local, keep the money we spend here in Wales. My advice, as, as Ken mentioned, a few things about uh, uh, apprenticeships and how do we engage with the BAME community. My advice over the last decade has always been the same, which is to get more BAME people into tech, um, we need to utilize the BAME people already in the positions there and get them to engage with those people they want to hire. From experience, I can tell you it's difficult working somewhere you're in essentially cultural isolation change the interview and the recruitment process, just going by what the public sector does at the moment. For example, and I don't want to be, you know, seem to be bashing them, but they're asking for people to fill in CVs and then a long complicated application form. You know, I hate to say, but that's HR's job. You know, it's what you pay them for internally to gather that information. But having been people at key touch points throughout the process, you can't go wrong. One of the disturbing things I noticed was that even Welsh media turned a blind eye to BAME excellence when they show off their top six, 30 successful people in Wales, under 30 or 35 or even 40, which I'm getting closer to, is very rarely highlighting BAME professionals. They may throw in one or two successful restaurant owners, you know, then they worked hard for that position. But that's not going to inspire young BAME tech candidates to stay here in Wales. They will go where they see themselves excelling and being recognized for it. Even myself, I was rejected by the Wales Online campaign in favor of an almost exclusively white candidate list several years previously. And they were not to, you know, brag or, or, or what have you, not even close to the level of success and the money I was bringing into Wales at the time. And just to get back to what Keba touched upon, 
um, earlier. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that, that right. Apologies for getting it wrong. Um, I actually sent in an application for a board position on a public appointments. Um, I, I was advised by, by, by several people to do that. I haven't heard from them in over two years, even after an exhaustive application form. Anyway, I think one solution we need to offer is apprenticeships, internships for BAME people, 16 and 18 year olds. Um, you know, just the young people at that age, I think that's a very crucial, crucial age and have a procedure whereby training and work is combined. Because of the cultural complexities of being of BAME heritage, work and getting into work tends to supersede further education. You know, they need to bring home the bacon as it were. This becomes a barrier for BAME candidates in the tech industry because the majority, if not all of the tech roles and these professional roles require further education. Now, I have actually implemented something that was called the Sunrise Program for Hitachi Data Systems, a, a global multinational um, who were in a similar position where there was a dearth of BAME candidates and young people entering the industry. We took on interested young candidates, offered them full-time jobs and salary, and they learned on the job skills, received industry accreditations. But the focus was always on the quality of job Okay, and every year they received a, a review and a plan of what they needed to, to achieve to take the next step up. It, it's simple enough to implement. You ensure they have a mentor. You know, you ensure the job is done. I think sometimes we don't give our young people the credit that they can fit into a professional environment. Two things happen when you do this. You give the person who's the mentor the skills to begin down the path to management. And the mentee knows that they are not alone in a fast paced environment, which is always the case in the tech industry. This allows for organic, organic growth, keeps costs down and increases retention of long term talent. Look, I hope I haven't gone on for too long as I, as I appreciate it's a Friday afternoon and I, and I hope I have perhaps given a deeper insight into the tech community and the challenges it faces in general. Uh, also, uh, from a BAME attraction standpoint. So th thank you very much for everybody listening. And thank you, uh, Shivana, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Hurum. Um, I think that you have definitely given us all food for thought. And I'm sure I can see Kenneth sat there and I could, and, you know, I, I know how, <laughs> how he is only in meetings. So I'm looking at his body language and I know his brain is going through somersaults and he's connecting all sorts of dots so, so <laughs> I'm sure um, you you know you you he's probably going to contact you or contact me and we'll probably end up communicating at some point but um, without a thank you so much um, without further ado um, I am going to bring in Amal Beruti who is the project manager and team um, leader for Golden Years Let's Age Well project for Women Connect First um, and Deva are going to be speaking, and it's not just Amal, Amal will be speaking with, um, I understand, some members of her team as well. And they're going to be talking about developing a community-based social enterprise, uh, World Cafe and their next steps. So Amal, over to you. Thank you, Shavana, for giving us this opportunity to present our Wales World Cafe, which is a community-led catering model for um, BME women's skill to become uh, income generating and give them independence. I'm the project manager for the Golden Years project for um, Let's Age Well. Sorry, Let's Age Well. It's for women 50 plus, BME women 50 plus at Women Connect First. Our aim is to maximize participation and integration of vulnerable um, and marginalized BME women from diverse communities, and we continuously ensure to develop their skills. Before I introduce the Wales Wealth Cafe, I'd like to mention one point here. My experience at Women Connect First previously was a placement link officer, helping women into securing employment. Most of BME countries uh, people must work to earn. They don't have the social uh, welfare benefit. For that reason, most of the women have either university degrees, diplomas, or a general skill to work and earn money. And they have 
long years of work experience. But unfortunately, when they arrive in the UK, their employment and their degrees are not recognized. So they stay at home with time and they have the language barrier mainly. So staying at home, they lose their skill, they lose their knowledge, their um, degrees become outdated and uh, eventually they, they lose their self-confidence and this result in failing every single attempt to find a job. This whole um, uh, atmosphere brought the idea for the uh, cafe, the community cafe, where a group of women from the Golden Years project, um, they are aged 50 plus, they are required by the job center to find a job. Of course, they fail every single um, chance um, because of the language barrier all their applications and work interviews were not successful. They also didn't have, the, there are no opportunities to get sensitive learning environments where they could develop their skills. Environments, uh, cultural environments and environments according to their um, uh, uh, language abilities. So um, they suggested to start cooking and develop uh, the skill of cooking for catering uh, business. This uh, started at Women Connect First. When they joined, we started doing uh, training sessions. So they have done food hygiene level two. They've done introduction to starting a business, safety in the kitchen and other uh, businesses. And they applied their learning in the Friday Cafe which uh, gave people from the community a safe place to meet, socialize, while they are enjoying a freshly cooked meal. And uh, uh, the cafe became a very huge success. People attended lunch, uh, people from the community, organizations, uh, participants at Women Connect First, and uh, uh, from the public sector. Um, it became a very huge success and um, people started sharing their stories and telling their friends about the food um, at the cafe. This opened doors for the cafe to start catering for meetings and training sessions at Women Connect First and at different other organizations. They have done pop-up cafes at Public Health Wales, Valendra in different places and different events. They've taken part in the summer festivals. They catered for a wedding and for the South Wales Police um, Awards um, at the Central Station. Um, this is a community-led enterprise that Women Connect First Management uh, and Board were looking into the steps of moving forward um, in uh, having it as a social a register social enterprise, but then with the lockdown, things have changed. The time now is, has come for women who are ready to go for their next step, for their developing this community social enterprise. And um, I hope we can be a good model for building um, uh, on uh, our community. It's uh, building on the skills. It, you know, the uh, ethnic minorities, they have different skills. And if their skills are built, um, uh, help to upskill and go forward, I think most of them will have income generating uh, uh, skills to depend on and become independent, financially independent. I'd like to thank you all for listening and thank uh, Women Connect First uh, this uh, uh, cafe is not, um, is not funded by any grants. It just came out from the women who come to our center and it was supported by um, the board and the management. And um, uh, Maria, our director, Maria Constanza, I'd like to thank her for that. And thank the cafe team who worked really hard as volunteers for two years to make money, they have worked day and night, sometimes weekends, to improve their skills and
proof that they can reach there and they can become really income generating. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamal. That was brilliant. Um, thank you um, for thank you for joining us and and for for giving us some real food for thought. If anything, actually, you've made me really hungry. Um, I haven't actually yet eaten at the cafe, but I have seen photos. But now that I hear about it, it's it's starting to like yeah. So you well, might see I my don't face. Have, I don't have right. the real skills to run a video, but um, I tried uh, with Shaheen. Maybe next time we can show you a video of the different menus and food that they serve. It's really mouth-watering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Amal. Thank you. Okay, so next up we have um, Raj Singh from SP Entertainment. Um, Raj is going to be speaking to us today um, on the unforecasted business crisis and exploring ways to survive. Um, some of you may know Raj um, as he has recently um, been seen on BBC and on Twitter and so many different things because um, as well as running his business, he does also uh, play the doll. And that's just something that he was doing during uh, lockdown uh, within the community, within uh, Shirley Road in particular, um, as, as part of the, um, the thanks for the key workers and, and just to kind of lift up the spirit a little bit. So I'm going to hand over to Raj, who is hopefully online and he can take over. Yeah. Hey, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me today. Um, first and foremost, some really amazing speakers, uh, really inspirational. Um, it's been such a great experience to be on this call. Um, definitely got me thinking in different ways and ways to progress and uh, it's really uh, positive to see so many people doing so many positive things in order to make Wales a fair um, environment for everybody it's it feels really really good so thank you everybody um, yeah so in regards to my company I own a company called SP Entertainment based in Cardiff I'm born and bred uh, in Wales, in Cardiff, studied in, at Cardiff University. Um, I've run my business for the best part of 12, 13 years now. Um, we mainly do, a, we specialize in Asian weddings, but we've more recently done a lot of corporate events, providing entertainment from drummers, dancers, singers, etc., and DJs to um, light and sound equipment um, for most sort of public events. Obviously, as most of you are aware, given the current circumstances, uh, everything's come to a halt at the moment. And we don't really see where, we don't have a date. Understandably, no one to blame, obviously, um, but we don't really have a date um, as per when we will be resuming. So difficult for a lot of brides and grooms, difficult for a lot of families. Uh, we, we conduct about 250 events a year. Um, between 250 and 300. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of customers to deal with, um, a lot of postponed dates. Some customers are that unsure that um, they want refunds, um, et cetera, which is difficult for us because going from having zero, well, from having a good income where we could do that, we can accommodate because we are, we are made by the community. Uh, we don't specialize in no heavy marketing campaigns. It's all word of mouth. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, we like to keep all of our customers happy and it, it's because it has been quite difficult in saying to a customer that, look, we can't refund you right now. Um, so please do bear with us. Um, it, it gets a bit difficult because we are normally a company that just say yes all the time. However, uh, with help of loads of neighbors, um, loads of aunties and uncles all around, uh, we've been able to stay positive and help loads of people. I've done Zoom events uh, whilst I play instruments or DJ uh, from my office here um, to their small gatherings in their house. I'm doing small things and yes, the thanks for key workers. That was really good. I had some amazing positive messages uh, from off of the back of that. So it's really nice. But I'm just, I suppose, trying to now diversify because I, I don't see... Weddings, firstly, at a large scale, uh, happening anytime soon. And then being of the Bain community, um, 
being identified as high risk then putting four or five hundred of them in one room <laughs> is not going to be uh, people's first priority really um, so yeah it's something we have to really consider and even when we do go back um, because we manage a lot of events as well so it's going to be something we have to think about protocols what's the best way to move forward um, in the meantime organizing the business revamp doing everything we can in the background to make sure um, everything is efficient and effective um, and also to try try to diversify so it, we are struggling a little bit but where we can try if we can help people virtually we're doing so but obviously with connectivity and delays it, it's not always as good as it is um, but hopefully we can continue and find new ways to diversify and come out on top I suppose at the end of this Thank you, Raj. Um, really good to hear from you. Um, I am, I, once this virus is over, I'm not being funny, but we are definitely going to have one of the most insane parties. So yes, um, for those of you um, who haven't heard Raj uh, on his door, I ask that you check him out. But also, he's an amazing DJ. So yeah, trust me, he can definitely like get a party going. Like if he was DJing right now, we would have a lot of movement. It would be absolutely insane. Thank so you. thank you so much, Raj. Thanks. Um, I am going to ask our next speaker to, to join us. Um, so our next speaker, we have Margaret Ogunba, Ogunna, Ogun Bambo. I should know this because my husband's actually Nigerian and you know he is a good thing that he's not sat next to me um, from Maggie's um, actually some of you might know Margaret um, because she has been on the TV recently for reasons that I'm sure she will be able to explain herself um, but uh, the she's from Maggie's African twist to your everyday dish She's specifically going to be talking about the journey of the grafting of female black business entrepreneur in Wales. Um, some of you may have seen the video as well that we circulated when Maggie was speaking. Um, and she's got a really interesting story and I'm, I'm really happy that she's been able to join us. And um, I hope that she is on the line. So I'm going to hand over now and mute myself. Hi, thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you. So um, I'm Margaret Ogumbanwo, um, and I've always been of Maggie's Exotic Foods, but um, generally people talk about Maggie's or Maggie's sauces. So recently we are in the process of changing it all up. So we're known as Maggie's and we bring an Afri African twist to your everyday dish. Um, I've listened to so many great speakers and, you know, it's not so much how am I going to follow them. It's, there's so much they've said that I agree with that I want to touch, but I can't touch all of them. But Roger started with, I was minding my business, he said. Well, I was minding my business on the 14th of June. And so you know how movies are, they show you the future and the past. Well, let me take you back a bit. So my background is that I was born in the UK um, and, brought, and brought up in Nigeria specifically. Um, and one of my first experiences of women in business was women on the roadside um, in the evenings with their children there trying to earn a, a little bit of money to feed their family the next day and Amal did mention that um, a lot of people from BME communities must work to earn that was my experience of women and so I, um, I, I grew up understanding this you just work to get your money graft is where the word came from so i've been in wales 13 years um and i started a calf two years after i came to wales um but before that i attended farmers markets and it um, went on from farmers markets to um shows um and the reason was 
we came to Welsh, uh, to Wales, to North Wales, and I, we live in an 80% Welsh speaking community. If we wanted a job, we had to speak Welsh. Um, any job anyway that went along with our qualifications. But then I've always been in food. So I started going to farmers markets and we're talking a real graft because I started from cooking at home, taking things there. My family were fed up of eating all the things I froze that I didn't um, sell in the market from week to week. Anyway, I started two Welsh classes two weeks into arriving here. Um, because I believe that it helps to understand people better if you understand their uh, markets. So I went from markets, cafe, and then I experienced a really significant life change and I closed the cafe. Um, but while we were having cafes, I decided to bring a bit of Africa um, to North Wales by having pop-up African restaurants. And those became really um, more successful than the cafe. So when I closed the cafe, I concentrated on doing that. And um, if you, when you're eating food from parts of Africa, some of them are nice and spicy, some of them are fruity. So when it came to the spicy evenings, we would, um, I would not be able to make the food as spicy for my audience, but I always had a pepper sauce of some description. So come 2015, I made this fab sauce. I'm saying it's fab myself. I tasted it and I'm like, whoa. And I asked my family, whoa, whoa. Long and short, people are like, why don't you bottle this? So 2016, um, may I remember, because Will Void Carnarvon, which is a food festival, um, launched. And that's where I launched my, my sources. Um, the mayor, it was her first day. She launched it. I launched my sources. I sold out in the first four hours. I thought I'd make about, you know, a hundred pounds if it was a really successful day. And I, I, I sold out of my sources. Anyway, so. Um, from that, we've been going for um, uh, for over three years now, I think going on four years, and it has been a graft. And just listening to some of the other speakers, one of the things Kuram said was, um, there were things he had to pick up. There were things I didn't know. There were not people that I could um, turn to to speak to or to ask about it. And one of the things I would say about myself, I was born in the UK, so I'm fairly fluent in English, but I recognize that many BMEs um, do not have English as a first language, a bit like where I'm living. English isn't their first language, so I tried to learn their language so I could communicate. And so it's difficult to know who to go and ask. When I first arrived, I was told that... Um, uh, there was someone I could talk to, um, um, and I did go and talk to him. He was supposed to um, be the representative for the BME communities, but his funding had run out, and that was the end of the, the thing. So I have slugged for four years to get to know what I needed to know. Um, I, for example, um, in um, two years into the business, I heard of um, Cowine, which provides help for small businesses to set up their websites and pictures and things like that. At two years, I had set up my own website. I had spent my own money and I didn't, I didn't get to know about it. So one of the things I have I've picked up um, from people talking and I have found is that um, there are, there are, and I think the minister talked about it, there are bodies out there, but there are not people in the bodies who speak our language. And we are used to grafting, like Amal said, we are used to just doing it ourselves. It's not very easy for a BME or a black person to go out looking for loans. It's not, what, or grants, it's not what we do. We just get on and put our own money into it. And therefore, that's what I call the graft. And I call it the graft of the uh, female entrepreneur because we, like I said, what I saw was women working on the side of the road to provide um, food for their children the next day. We all, a lot of us grew up with that. You work so that you can provide you can provide food for your family or food for wherever. So there's a long graft, and part of the issue of that is that they're not people representatives, like someone said, speaking our language, who I can go to and who I can ask. What can I do? Where can I do? How can I get hold? I, I'm I'm in touch with um um. Business Wales. I'm in touch with quite a lot of other um, bodies now, which I wasn't aware of. And when people see me, so when people see, <laughs> when people see what happened to me on the 14th of, of June, um, I walk every day. I went out to walk and I have a beautiful red garage door and there was a swastika or whatever it is. But the, the first thing I thought was swastika painted on my door. And I'm like, oh no, they did not. I mean, I don't think in race, I don't think in color, except people bring it to me. And of course, we've all had experiences of people bringing that to us. So 
I, I, yeah, started started a journey. I have to say that they um, during these times of COVID, business came to a halt because a lot of my business was through um, festivals, fairs, and and big trade trade shows. Um, I was all earning almost no money. I fell through the gaps in terms of grants and whatever it is they were providing. Um, the only thing that I had access to was Sybils and. Um, because my business was just coming into profit, that didn't amount to very much. Um, however, having had the 14th of June and put this on Facebook, we have had such an amazing outcry that people have come to support my business that I don't even, we, don't, we haven't even fulfilled all the orders that came on the 17th of June now. We, it, it, it has become a huge thing for us. It has opened us up to different um, different opportunities. And it has also provided the means that I had because we, I mean, talk about losing over 85% of your income, but do you know what? We're back there and uh, there are a lot of BME females who are grafting to try and get into business. It would be nice if there were mentors. It would be nice if there were mentors who understood their language. It would be nice, and I don't mean the spoken language, the way we think. Um, it would be nice if there were mentors who can signpost us to what it is we really need uh, uh, moving on from here. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really inspirational. And I, what I really liked about what you said was, is that we need people who speak our language, who actually understand when we say something, what does that mean? When we, when we provide an analogy or an example, what does that actually mean? Somebody who just gets it really quickly and you don't have to go into some kind of long speech in order to explain or provide lots of papers in order to explain exactly what it is that you're talking about. So thank you so much. Um, as I said earlier, we will be taking questions um, at the end of all of this. We've still got a, a few more speakers. Um, I also just wanted to, uh, I am gonna um, bring in uh, Jane Hutt, who is also, I understand, uh, joined us um, today um, at some point, uh, but I, I just wanted to give her a, a quick shout out and welcome. Um, welcome, Jane. Um, Jane Hutt is the, um, Deputy Minister and Chief Whip for Welsh Government. Many of you will have been will have heard um, Jane speak. Um, she's been engaging with um, with the Black communities, BME communities for some time, uh, both before and during COVID as well. So I just wanted to say that, and I will bring Jane in there some um, after a couple of more speakers. So um, the next speaker we have is Abdul Sheikh, who is the Artistic Director and CEO at Theo. Um, he is going to be speaking about the uh, about Black, Asian and ethnically diverse theatre and reconfigurating monocultural, uh, reconfiguring the monocultural sector. Um, so over to you. Over to you, Abdul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say uh, before I start, um, just what Margaret was saying in terms of um, grafting, I think often um, we make things go a lot further just because we have to and I think you know what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Theo and our context um, a bit more about our projects um, and, and kind of what we've been doing uh, during COVID and some of the future projects we have in the pipeline and then talk a little bit about the challenges and some of the current kind of major problems within the sector and the response that we've led in terms of trying to uh, create a, a more equitable equal um, arts and cultural sector here in Wales. Um, there is a lot of talk at the moment about theatre and uh, what's going on and the fact that you know there's a lot of organisations um, which will struggle and lots of theatre buildings which will struggle um, and it's interesting that a lot, a lot of those places are talking about the kind of work that we've been doing and the way that we've been working and advocating for a long time and suddenly that's become the thing that they need to do Whereas we've been doing it for such a long time, it feels like we've been shouting about it uh, and no one's been listening. But finally, hopefully the time has come and we can, um, we can do the work that we've been doing with a bit more resource. So FIO in Latin means to belong, to create, to grow. We're an international arts charity and a theatre company working across the UK and internationally. But we're based in Cardiff in Splot. We make interesting political and provocative work um, that 
wants to bring about change and deliver social justice. Uh, we've got a track record for new productions, uh, which have had critical acclaim. We've, we provide artist training and development, and we also provide community engagement projects. Um, COVID-19 and now Black Lives Matter has in, un, uh, in no uncertain terms shown us how unequal our society is. So FIO as a company has been more resilient than others, um, mainly because it's driven by people um, it serves and also um, those who serve it. Um, in terms of myself and my team, it is always about kind of the people that we're working with. And therefore we go above and beyond more often than not in terms of the, the funding that we get. Uh, whilst we can't employ lots of people at this particular point, we certainly can engage a lot of people. And that's the kind of uh, value that we've been working from, um, whether that's young, old, or the sector. So some of the current projects that we have, uh, Fio Pen to Paper, a really simple challenge that we've put to people. We just asked them to write us a letter um, and it was to try and support people to spend time away from screens, uh, try and kind of create mindfulness and, and an opportunity to kind of really get them away from a screen. And we've had letters from all over the world, lots of media attention, including the BBC Wales feature and also being plastered on a Cardiff city centre billboard. Um, that project cost us very little to be fair financially, but it had a real kind of impact. Unheard Voices in partnership with Women Connect First, and the Golden Years project that Mao was talking about. Um, we, we've been working with women from a range of backgrounds and presenting back their stories um, to them as poetry. We're hoping to develop this further and fundraise for it. Um, so at the moment, that's what we're doing. Um, a New Normal, which is an animation project free for young people. Um, and we've done some fundraising around this to be able to lend young people data and iPads to join us in response to the data poverty issues that we've seen. A future project, Orchard of Lost Souls, which is uh, going to tour nationally across Wales, is about the Somali civil war, uh, told through the eyes of three women. Um, it's also going to tour across England and there's plans to tour it to Australia and Canada. Uh, Rebuilding a Nation is a series of action oriented state of the nation events, pan Wales, asking local communities about how we rebuild our nation post-Brexit, post-COVID, and now after Black Lives Matter to create a more equitable and fair society. Amma uh, is a virtual reality project working with older women from the Bangladeshi community with the view to creating an exhibition which would tour across the UK and internationally. Um, so we feel we are really well placed to service the sector because of how and who we engage. We listen, we respond to people's needs um, rather than providing what we think people want. Uh, we're doing this um, and have an impact on a range of other sectors, including health and well-being, education, prisons, and heritage. Uh, we're taking the Welsh brand out internationally without any Welsh government support, but rather my personal international contacts from India to Sri Lanka, Australia to Canada, and lots of other places in between. We're an associate company with the Lowry in Manchester, one of the biggest art centers in the UK. However, we've struggled with getting support in the same way in Wales. The current data for the arts is as follows. 67 regularly funded ACW organizations, so portfolio of core funded orgs. Only one is BAME led, and that's not us. Um, so all of the work that I described above is all project based and we get money on a project by project basis. Arts Council of Wales employs zero staff who are black, Asian and ethnically diverse. The creative industries in Wales has 90% of its companies based in Cardiff. 20% of Cardiff's population is black, Asian and ethnically diverse. The creative industries in Wales has a woeful 4% diverse workforce. We need change, and I personally don't expect the current Arts Council of Wales to deliver these changes. Uh, for me, we're asking the same leadership team to change the very issues they have allowed to percolate and fester under their watch for the last 20 years. A collective of concerned individuals led by Theo, myself, uh, and a group of other really great colleagues have developed a conversation under the banner Wales Culture and Race Task Force. This has grown quickly and organically, and we've created a six point plan, which I'm really happy to put in the chat after I finish. Um, and it is just 
a plan that's the starting point of further conversations. Uh, we've also led a fundraising campaign, which has raised over £20,000 in only two weeks, uh, in order to pay Black, Asian and ethnically diverse freelance artists, educators and arts workers. Again, um, I'm happy to share the letter that was shared uh, with the industry. So the industry funded us, uh, but Arts Council Wales hasn't. So we've, get, we've had the money directly from a range of arts organisations and individuals. Um, and it's a shame that Arts Council Wales are not supporting this initiative because really they should be doing the work. Uh, we're hoping that this is the embryonic stages of a Black, Asian and ethnically diverse artist network. We hope this network will speak as one voice and will speak to power to make public funding uh, be better distributed. Uh, equally, we're ex exploring a bunch of other ideas, uh, such as a partner system to help us fund our own work. Um, partner being, uh, I don't know if, if everyone's uh, aware of what the, how that works, but people put into a pot uh, and then each month, each, you know, whatever the time scale is, every three months, people uh, will decide who gets that money to be able to spend um, on whatever they want. But in this situation, I think what we would want to do is obviously fund uh, colleagues' work. Um, a shared calendar so we can support each other's events. Uh, so we're not putting on events all at the same time. Um, and then we're also exploring ways to, for the, the, the network to be able to advise and support a range of organizations who are looking uh, at making change. Uh, this would be a paid for service. Um, and already we've got the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama engaging with us. And we've had inquiries for us to potentially work with the Welsh Local Government Association uh, in terms of their supporting their equalities plan. Um, in particular, culture and art. Um, finally, some other issue or kind of wider issues uh, that the sector faces at the moment. Um, the end of the furlough scheme, uh, which FIO hasn't been able to engage with because we're project funded and everyone's freelance in the team. Um, the end of the furlough scheme will create a cliff edge. Uh, there will be a significant level of redundancies, redundancies and insolvencies uh, this side of Christmas. Uh, I think we're going to risk, uh, after that, there will be a real risk that um, the structural inequalities will deepen and I think cultural organisations, if they were given the support now, could potentially you know, change this for a lot less than what it will cost later down the line. Um, the other issue is the UK furlough scheme is paying for people just to stay at home and do nothing. Um, other countries uh have provided support to enable arts organizations and artists to bring people together during the pandemic and enable voices to be heard rather than siloed and silenced um it's a real shame we're not doing this here um, and could we potentially explore how that could happen here in wales uh for me i think that's it we kind of operate on a 160 grand budget we do all of that we've got you know organizations that get a lot more regularly and do a lot less. So um, yeah, we make we graft. <laughs> Just to kind of go back to what I started with. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Abdul. Um, just only one proviso in in terms of what you said. One point, and that is, is that some people are obviously furloughed and and uh, they are home, not out of choice, not working. Um, and of course, there are a number of people who've got care responsibilities and children who are currently not in school. So they're looking after their kids. So just on just on that point. But otherwise, what's really good is that you have have waited and you have, you know, found some real solutions and potential answers for how we move forward in this sector. And uh, this is a sector that's been talked about quite a bit recently. So um, I can, I've just noticed that Taranjeet is um, uh, going to be leaving one of our earlier speakers. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I am going to move on then to our next speaker, who is Nancy Alfred Oyekoya, who is from the Nancy Beauty in Swansea. Um, and some of you might have actually seen her video as well that we circulated um, on our social media. And Nancy is going to be speaking specifically on the multiple challenges um, survival for a specialist hairdressing salon in Wales. Thank you so much, Nancy, for, for being able to join us today. 
and I am really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, can I just ask if you can hear me? Yes. Yes, that's great. Thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Nancy. I'm a director at Nancy Beauty, and this is my husband, Alfred. He will have time, um, a chance to introduce himself. Um, just a little background to what we do. We're specialized in um, hair extensions and different um, types of braids. We also provide some uh, beauty services such as um, facials and um, threadings and all other beauty treatments. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, take this opportunity to acknowledge and appreciate um, the recent economic and uh, policies of the government during this pandemic uh, to support not just big businesses, but also small businesses, including self-employed. Um, this really shows their commitment to do whatever it takes to help everyone. Um, but the reason why we're here today is that um, we're going to talk about the challenges small businesses, especially um, BME businesses, such as beauty, um, beauty salons um, like ours, are facing in Wales. Um, so it's important to reflect on the challenges um, small businesses are um, facing in especially in the light of so much potential of the business we run. Um, sorry, just a second. Um, so um, a very good example we wanted to talk about today is the fact that uh, we want a contract with NHS um, as the only salon in South Wales and one of the few in Wales as um, an approved NHS supply of wigs and accessories to um, supply to cancer and um, alopecia patients um, in the nation. Um, when we tried to um, approach the high street lenders, they were by default not keen to look at our books for finance. Even after trading for almost a decade, seven years to be precise, without any going concern problem, it was still um, it was until the introduction of the bounce back loan initiative that the bank were keen to support businesses like ours with finances and this just shows the power uh, the government have over the banks if they choose to look into this um, I'll, um, I'll let Alfred um, finish off in this thoughts um, but I <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think it's, it's important to highlight the, the, the process that we actually went through to even got the NHS contract. I think all just 23 you know, companies in, in the nation has that contract, and we're actually the only one in Wales that has that direct contract with NHS to supply nationwide you know, to you know, cancer patients. But what actually amazed me was when we took those contract documents and the records of the of the business to the bank to say, can you please finance us so that we can actually grow this potential? And they're like, you know, by default, we're not even willing to listen and we're not even willing to look at the books. And eventually I made a case to insist that, no, well, you've been a banker for so many years, you have to like consider it. But eventually they looked at it and then they still said no. So, but in, in the other way around, if you look at what happened with this bounce back loan, we applied for it as well. And then they didn't even look at the books and then they approved it. And that's why we think like the government needs to understand that you know there is so much influence the government can have over financial institutions. I think by default, most financial institutions are so keen to look at big businesses, you know, be established you know, businesses and not just self-employed or small businesses, but they can actually have an influence over these financial institutions. And if anyone is here who is self-employed or running a small business, I'm sure you would have had challenges also sticking mortgages and stuff like that. You know, you are just seen as a troublemaker, someone that will not even fulfill your obligations, even when your record shows that you can finance it. I think that's one thing we would like to highlight, that government should really try and look at the relationship between banks and small businesses, and especially in the light of so many businesses, you know, you know, letting go of staff at this moment, saying 1,500 jobs is going down. We just believe that having small businesses, especially self-employed businesses, can really be a catalyst for economic regeneration in Wales. 
and not just for their families. Also, it takes a lot of burden of the government of people living on benefits. Because the more people are prospering in their finances, the more they are not like a burden, so to speak, to government in terms of welfare. So, and one of the ways these businesses can grow is when they get this financial support from the institution. But it is important to also mention that the Welsh government as a development bank, which you would have thought that could actually bridge that gap when it comes to accessing finance. But the same problem you also experienced, I remember approaching even the development bank then, and it is somewhat skewed towards favoring these big businesses as well. And we didn't even have any success, you know, with the Development Bank of Wales as well. And then the third option you might also think of is business wheels. And, and I think at the moment, a lot of good information is out there about what business wheels is doing in terms of theory. But when it comes to the practice of it, to the benefits, accessibility of it, it's not, there's no connection, especially for the BME group, you know. It's almost like you are being passed around. It's, eventually, it becomes like a switch box, and then you are being passed around to different people, and you still don't get the financial support. Uh, but I must admit that in terms of every other support, in terms of you know documentation or training, business rules have done very well. But when it comes to that financial support, which sometimes can be the lifeblood, what an organization needs, you know, it's, it's not there. Another thing I would just like to emphasize that the government needs to look into when it comes to supporting small businesses is also looking at the overhead, like an extension of the business rate relief. As we are aware, a lot of high street businesses are closing down. And with this pandemic, there's so much addiction now to online purchases. And the trend might continue. And the, the consequence of that is that a lot of people might not approach or patronize high street traders anymore. And we really need high street businesses to remain on our streets and on our highway. And that's why I would like to also appeal to the economic minister to look into the extension of business rate relief, you know, not just for this year, but at least for the next two years, to allow businesses to call, to be able to, you know, you know, like a kind of comfort for this period, you know, an extension of the business rate relief. Then one more thing I would just like to add from the expenses point of view is the, you know, the parking charges, you know, like I, I noticed that with big businesses, you know, they kind of enjoy having, for example, unlimited number of their staffs on discounted parking rates with the council, such that if there's a parking, you know, available, they don't pay the full amount on a monthly basis, and they get that so easily. But when you look at small businesses that are actually established, paying business rates and other levy, close to those parking owned by the council, they can't even pay discounted parking rates, you know. And I think this is an initiative that the government can also look into to help businesses, that if your business is located close to a parking space owned by the government, you should be entitled to what, for example, the BT, the likes of Virgin, would enjoy for their staff in terms of paying a subsidized monthly rate. Because as simple as, you know, a parking charge, it adds up at the end of the day to be part of the overhead, like small businesses can actually avoid, you know, and also it kind of shows like a signal to the business owners that the government is actually on their side to support them, you know, for these businesses. So I just think by and large that, you know, a lot of power is in the hands of the government to support businesses, not just, you know, small businesses, especially BME businesses. And I think if the government can actually use that to ensure that that bridge, you know, that communication is there by creating this kind of platform to allow small businesses to actually speak up to highlight areas where they think those help will be needed the most. I think it can go a long way in helping businesses. Yeah, just just to um, let everybody know about one of the um, activities that we've run in the salon is um, to do with social enterprise. We actually provide a training for young women who are um, in need to go into the um, hair and beauty industry and learn new skills. Uh, we provide this free of charge and we have not received any funding for it. Um, yeah, if you know anybody who's interested in something like that, they should contact us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. That was really interesting to hear. Um, just to, um, I, I think you've, you've definitely given us loads of food for thought and we will make sure that um, even if the, the ministers have dropped off from the call at some point, because I can't see everyone that's on, we will be feeding all of this information back as well. So, you know, the points that you've made, if there's anything else that I feel that, you know, we might have missed, I'll come back to you and, and query that so we can kind of put you, link you guys up and, and make sure that you get the information.
information that you need and some of the the the, the points that you've made are really important and they, and they need to know about those so, so thank you so much for joining us um, Shab, next um, I would like Shab, to I am here <laughs> Shab, yes, oh, yeah, I'm sorry I was just going to say I can I ask you a few words yes absolutely I was, you, you are next on my list <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Because I, I just, I just came from a. I had to come from another event, so I came in halfway through. So I'm sorry if I've missed um, a great deal of what have been what I've heard. Very inspiring contributions. But I know that you. I mean, the chat is such an important way of recording, um, not just other contributions, people who haven't spoken, but also links and responses. So I, I know that. Um, you will be recording all of this because I just really wanted to say um, that what you're doing this afternoon is so important for us in the Welsh Government because you've called this event a just transition, building back better for BME communities in Wales. And that's such a strong message for the Welsh Government. So, you know, I'm glad I've been able to come and, I, uh, come and at least say thank you for all that you've already uh, shared with with us this afternoon but also that I would want to I, I know this will come in some form of a submission uh, to the Welsh Government because the recovery and how we recover um, is critically important so I just I wanted to thank thank you all for all your contributions but also say um, that this is something not just for me as Equalities Minister but it's um, for particularly today I think for um, the economy and, and transport minister, Ken Skates, I don't know if he's been able to join earlier on, um, but I mean, he, it, it's important for me that all the ministers of the Welsh government listen to all of the points that are made, but specifically today on business and skills, I, I've listened and heard what the difficulties that people are facing at the moment. Um, also the positives uh, as well, because one of the things I did want to say is that we can uh, we we work very closely with the Wales TUC uh, because we have to as social partners the Wales TUC will guide us in government to get this right and I think it was very important that actually right at the at the beginning we actually did work with the Wales TUC to make a statement to say that we were going to be working very closely to see how employers were treating their workforces and actually. Um, you know that the, we had a joint statement um, outlining expectations of employers during this pandemic and when we have obviously there are lots of schemes and we've heard about them today there's lots of schemes uh, from the UK government but Welsh government has come in with schemes of support for businesses individuals as well as uh, public services to complement the gaps that have been left by UK government schemes and in fact we have got uh, the new the scheme the economic resilience fund scheme which is only in Wales but I just wanted to, for, for the few words and time I've got because your work voices are more important than, than mine today but just to give you my reassurance that there are some key recommendations coming out of the socio-economic group um, on the uh, disproportionate impact on BAME communities and people of the coronavirus pandemic and you I hope you will know, all know about that report um, many of you were involved in helping to shape those recommendations particularly um, thanking Shavana for taking a, a key role in that from, from as far as Wales to UC is concerned but also um, or many others who are here today um, who, who played their part in that report but I, if I look at some of those issues on the report to do with the economy um, I think they are about some of the things that people have, have mentioned um, for example income safeguards to vulnerable BAME people we mentioned the furlough scheme um, we should be extending that to the most vulnerable uh, and developing policies that address poverty and insecurity exacerbated by COVID-19 um, and it, it is crucial that we get this right, as Shivana said, about the furlough scheme. But also another recommendation, Welsh Government must monitor and mitigate where possible a disproportionate impact of the coronavirus pandemic and likely recession on 
uh, BAME people. Now, it's something that uh, Shivana has said so many times at meetings. It's what's going to happen in the autumn. Are we going to have the worst recession? What are we going to do about employment, particularly for our young people, um, our young workers? Also, extending financial support that we should lobby UK government to extend financial support, support to gig economy workers and the self-employed. Many people here have talked about small businesses and self-employed people and I will report back on the experiences that people have had. The procurement contracts for zero hours contracts, I mean those are crucial and we have to look at that in relation to things we're not responsible for, for example immigration and make sure that we get uh, our message strong over to the UK government. But also I have to say, I was pleased to hear there was a procure, good, something good about procurement with the NHS um, for that, that wonderful business in Swansea today. So that was an example of good practice. So for me, this is about, again, saying, I, I'm here to listen to you. Obviously, Dr. I, can't, I haven't heard all of you, but you have more people to give contributions. We can only learn from listening to you and to taking this forward uh, but the main way we'll take this forward and all these reports that have come forward is through our Wales Race Equality Action Plan and that's going to cover more than just what's come out of the uh, BAME um, COVID-19 advisory group because it will cover education, it will cover not just health and social care, it will cover the economy, skills, it will cover culture, sport, it will cover housing. Um, housing obviously is crucial. So it will cover every aspect, it will cover leisure, it will cover the environment, it will cover agriculture, it will cover every aspect of Welsh life and every aspect of Welsh life has an impact on our communities, on our BAME communities, individuals and businesses. So I hope um, that that's just from me an expression of support and thanks that you are coming together today and we need this fed back from you and I will make sure that not just Ken, Skates and uh, but all ministers um, get that feedback and thank you very much for allowing me to speak Shivana. thank you. Thanks Jane. Um, I think that um, we've got uh, one more speaker before we open up for Q&A and I know people have been posting their questions up and we will take those. But just to say that, you know, of course we've got the, uh, you know, a, a potential of a global recession in front of us, but we've also got Brexit and, you know, so many other things that are happening at the same time. But also, of course, with Brexit, there's other opportunities potentially for, for us here in Wales in terms of how we, you know, what sort of Wales do we want to present to the rest of the world? So when we want the rest of the world to, to come and buy our products or to, in, to invest in services and, and businesses and so forth that we run here, it's really important that, um, that the Welsh Government presents the kind of picture of the we have. Um, of the people of Wales and, and, and the various different sectors that they work in and that, they, um, that they're building and their businesses and entrepreneurs and so many different individuals that are on, on the call today. So, um, you know, let, let's, let's, um, let's see where that goes. But, um, uh, you know, it's always a case of action speaks louder than words. And, and that's one of the things, as you know, Jane, that's something that's come up extremely strongly um, from everybody, regardless of um, which event it is, you know, not necessarily even ours, but so many other events that have taken place as well. So without, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, without further ado, um, I would like to ask Philip Henry to, to join us. Um, Philip specializes in Welsh black honeybees and building communities to be, to be bee friendly. So he is going to be um, speaking in a minute, hopefully. Hi, hi. Thank you very much. Good yes. afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good. Good evening. Early evening, one and all. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm, I'm, this is, a, you know, this is a beautiful occasion that we could use technology and to be able to still push forward such a valid conversation with input from such a varied um, 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 fabric 
that resides within the country called Wales. Um, so yes, my name is Philip Henry. Um, yes, um, yeah. So my name is Philip Henry, and I am a I'm currently a beekeeper um, and an horticulturalist. I use my beekeeping as a way of educating um, educating our people about environmental awareness and emotional literacy, um, and obviously the spirituality and the cultural um, connections that go with such things. Um, um, so I give a little preview of my history. Um, so 20 plus years ago, I participated um, in, the, in the highlight of, of um, the Stephen Lawrence and the, the, the William McPherson report in, uh, um, of the confirmation of institutional Lawrence, um, institutional racism. Them, that um, um, I was part of a group within Wales as well as a, a collective of within the UK who came together and made a charter um, through, well, we first formalised the, the National Black Youth Forum um, um, after, part, um, after working besides the British Youth Council. Um, that, so we established the National Black Youth um, Forum and within that forum, we therefore then um, focused on um, establishing a charter. Um, obviously, the charter really and truly was basic what, 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 what was, um, um, what, which was guaranteed to our fellow um, um, European and white um, um, and neighbours. Um, so basically, um, as I said, it, you know, it wasn't nothing. It wasn't we wasn't looking for favours, and that's it. Um, so yeah, we presented that to Westminster, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then a few years later, we, we myself and Nathan Evans, um, supported Robert Harvey to establish the, the Cardiff Black Youth Forum. Um, and therefore, because at that time, then the, um, the Synod, the Senate was, um, established, um, which we was happy about because we was for devolution. Um, and myself personally, I was for Brexit even in 2003. Um, because I understood that, um, you know, for us to deconstruct um, colonialism and to, to foster social cohesion, we have to focus on the majority experience um, um, and, and that is affecting our social um, fabric today. Um, so obviously I'm a descendant of uh, my parents, my parents are Jamaican, um, so therefore of the Windrush generation and therefore the transatlantic slaves. Um, so as I said, um, you know, um, the Commonwealth I feel is a, is a, is is a, is a, is a vote, a, 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 a repository of, um, of 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 unused wealth um, that unfortunately was um, um, neglected when um, um, in, when the EU um, happened. Anyway, these I progress and um, um, digress. Um, so basically, um, before I engaged in um, um, the National Black Youth forum i came i moved to cardiff um when i was in my four, about 14 years old i grew up in bristol um i grew up in bristol st paul's etc um that it was in bristol where i first wit and witnessed um what we would say um um racial prejudice and um violence etc um the the combat 18 and, and national front were very um very vibrant and very vocal um at that time um and obviously that had an effect on the community, especially when it, it, it seemed like some of the police were um, um, in, in, in cahoots um, or in solidarity with, 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 with the band. Um, and and, and as, a, as an eight-year-old child in Bristol, um, the, 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 the look that everybody witnessed, um, the world witnessed, um, the, the glint in the eye, um, of the, of that police officer, I won't name it, um, but that 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 coward who um, um, used uh, misused um, 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 his, his position of power um, to 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 to, um, to 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 take out another person's life. Um, when when I see that's that that look in his eye, I as an eight year old child witnessed that. Um, so as I said, um, you know, and, and therefore my community has witnessed that um, before as. The media would tell you 10 years ago when the hostile environment appeared. Um, I would like to remind people that my people came when it was no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Um, and I don't hold that sentiment to with a chip on my shoulder, but um, I, 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 I relate to it 
um, to to remind us that we have we have to return back to our our, our great great grandmother because um, even as um, David Attenborough confirms um, all humanity um, 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 as he said evolved um, 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 from Africa and, and therefore we need to um, show a solidarity not just in um, in, 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 the, in, in the form of political black, but, but also in um, harnessing our, our experience and centralizing it in a space. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I've been inspired by all of the conversations that I've heard. Um, unfortunately, I didn't come um, all the way, I, I didn't hear, I, I came about 20 minutes or maybe 40 minutes later on. Um, I was very inspired by um, the brother that was dealing with the iTech, the, um, the IT. Um, the reason I speak of this is because I attended um, um, the, 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 the Tram Shed um, Digi, uh, um, Digi Festival event um, um, when it first happened, or I think it was first happened two years ago, um, three years ago, I think. I was living in Riverside at that moment. Um, I'm in the Bay at this moment now. Um, and basically, when I attended there, um, um, basically, yeah, basically out of my out of my debt because I'm I wouldn't say I'm, com I'm, I'm computer literate myself, um, but I, I I went there with the with the aspiration of finding a, a dig um, the, the digital community to assist me in raising the awareness of my black Welsh honeybees, um, and and the reason um, obviously black Welsh honeybees are as I said are unique to Wales, um, but the the, 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 the symbiotic relationship I have with them is because um, without the Black Welsh honeybees, the farmers and everyday people within um, Wales wouldn't have the, the variety and the spice and the, and, and, and the taste um, and, and, and all of the other things that they call what they describe as good times and good memories. Um, so the, ex the, 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 the taking for granted of the Welsh Black honeybees is very similar to the experience of my people um, in the transatlantic slavery, um, which is, as I said, documented in the book um, Slave Wales, um, written by um, Chris Evans. Um, so as I said, um, yes, I'm fully aware of, uh, of, of the obstacles, and especially as being a Rastafarian who um, campaigns for my ancestral, um, cultural, social, economical practices, um, I'm, I'm big up to that Asian brother. I forgot, forgive me your name. Um, is it Theo? I'm the theater. When you mentioned the partner, Regin, respect, bro. Respect me, I tell you, because that, that me I deal with. Now, when I say what does institutional mean to me, institutional racism mean to me, you see the partner, because it was no blacks, no dogs, no Irish from the 50s, 60s, 70s. And even though that sign was moved out the window, the sentiment in the people's heart was still the same. We as a people had no access to funding. And this is my issue as a now, I'm a farmer. I'm an urban farmer, so I got livestock on my roof and several places in Cardiff, Penarth, um, and, and, um, and now I just recently got 11 acres just outside of Swansea. So I've got about 15 acres of land, no access to finance, no support and nothing. I've gone through all of the, to the, the certain type of um, um, institutions and whatnot, which was mentioned, and no support. But as I said, we graft. We graft not because we're seeking attention and we're trying to be rich. We are rich already. Let me finish on this. My beehives, my girls, they're born a millionaire. Let me explain what I mean. When the queen finds her habitation, she secures a territory. And the territory is around three, three, three kilometers or a mile and a half, et cetera, two miles. And that space is like, as I said, retail. Anything planted in there, so she's pollinating and getting, the, the, she's extracting the goodness from that and bringing it back into her savings account. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So, so that same philosophy, I am talking about bringing forward. So as I said, the challenges that we face as a BME community is, 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 is a marriage, but we need to centralize our resources by stop paying, by centralizing our resources. And by centralizing our resources, my suggestion is, and I approach the Sikh community 
at the Gudorara um, temple. Um, um, and, and I did get support from certain elders, one of the elders, Mr. Bogle. I hope you're still with us, brother. Um, and he, I spoke to him about us collectively having an interfaith community farm spread across a few several acres to celebrate the act of growing food. Because if we're trying to destroy racism, as Uncle Bob Marley said, a hungry man is an angry man. So we must cultivate resources and then ensure that a person can't hate another person because they haven't got no resources. We need to get to the psychological, to the logical, you know what I mean? To get to the root of the matter. So I know I can speak a lot. And as I said, I know that there's other people speaking. So my name is Philip Henry. I am currently an urban farmer, urban city farmer. So I have currently secured land in the, re in the rural region. I am seeking assistance to deal with recycling, cultivation of food, e-waste management, because I'm conscious 21 years ago I was in Ghana. And I still have the nightmare of seeing my, my younger siblings or my younger community members of the African, of the Ghanaian um, um, community, sifting through without no mask and out without no gloves. Through them thing there just to get a little money. It break my heart, star. So I am establishing on my 14, 15 acres that I'm in responsible for an e-waste management thing, and we are we are championing conscientious consumerism or ethical consumerism, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So respect to other entrepreneurs, respect to those who I've identified in this group already. Please contact me, and let's work together because only the solutions is going to come from us. Yes, the government must make some adjustments but the government don't have all the solutions because they didn't have the solutions before we came here as economic migrants. I'm speaking as the, the Windrush generation. So if they didn't have the, in the example, the, the, all of the solutions then, they didn't have it today. So therefore we must step up and play our part. And I'm so thank you, thankful that I was part of this discussion. And I look forward to participate in, in actual meetings. But guess what? I'm not just a talker, but I said to you, I got land. I'm, I'm a caretaker of the woodlands in, in Penas. I'm preparing space right now as we speak. I've got in volunteers. I'm trying to mobilize some of these youth and young people who are very agitated by the problem, what we are currently facing. And I'm trying to channel their frustration in positive, therapeutic, wholesome legacy work. And I need assistance. So thank you very much. I'm going to finish up there. Give thanks, His Majesty. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes, sir. yes, sir. Thank you. You're uh, silent, I think. Mute. Sharpen it, John Mute. I think we might have lost you, Anna. Oh, she's there. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Back? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's been lots of exchanges um, in, the, in the chat box um, about what Philip just said, actually. And what we will do is um, we will go through some of this and pull some of the information where people have shared so that we can uh, pass that on. Um, so that people can remain connected. I'm very conscious of the time because we did say that we were going to be finishing at 5.30. Amazingly, we do still have a number of people who were still on the call. Um, so I am going to, um, my team have been collating some of the chat and some of the questions. And um, whilst we, not, we may not be able to answer each and every question, we have tried to, um, I'll try and sort of address them in, in some sort of way so that we can have some exchanges. Some of our speakers have, have unfortunately um, had to leave, um, but we are going to run this until six o'clock. So at six o'clock, we are unfortunately going to have to come off, but there are some questions. So I am going to start running through those now. Um, if I may. So, um, I, the first question, actually, I am going to take to Keba, if he is still 
on the line with us. Um, so the first question is from Stuart Wadali. He has um, said, does the whole concept of being mask problem, mask being mask problems that employers as well as nursing unions need to solve. When you look at the intersections within Bain, there are clearly major problems such as just 39% of Bangladeshi and Pakistani women are in employment compared to 71% of all women, just 33% of 16 to 24 year old black people in employment, the lowest of any ethnic group in, um, in any range. Wales have the lowest rate of black employment across all of uh, UK government regions, um, standing at 56%. Black workers taking up a disproportionately high number of lower skilled jobs and a disproportionately lower number of managerial jobs. Now, a lot of this was, you know, featured um, in the, the PowerPoint presentation that we had from Nizreen as well earlier. And that Bangladeshi and black workers have much lower media rates of pay um, uh, as well. So half that of some other ethnic groups. So he has asked, when organizations can fall back on these figures and some groups, namely Black, Bangladeshi and Pakistani can have their issues ignored because of higher employment, progression and pay rates um, among other groups. So do we as unions need to start breaking being down? So in, in brackets, he then says as organizers and as in employers and should best practice for employers be the same? So I don't know if Kever is still with us and whether he would like to answer that question. Will attempt to answer it is a very very thank you. I'm, I'm with you, Savannah, and, and and thank you for that. Now, I will attempt to answer it uh, because it's, it's it's very detailed and of course long uh, question. But the gist of it yes, is, it. sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say just just try and answer it in some kind of roundabout way, yeah. I guess. Because yeah. yeah, that's right. That's that's right. Th th thank you, Savannah. I think for me. Um, it's very important for us as black people, and I did give the description of what we call black um, in unison. And if I may just stick to that definition, and, and by that, you know, it's, it's important to ensure that divide and rule does not um, achieve their objective. And that has been used in colonial times. It has been used during the war. It has been used in every other aspect of British institutions, and it is still being used here today. I gave an example of the days when um, the voluntary sector in Wales, nobody used to be able to say anything or nobody's willing to say anything because of fear of losing the funding from the Welsh government. Now, we know that that's, has, that's true and that happened because I've experienced it as chair of CWEC. Now, the issue now for us is we will not and we should not allow um, differences, people using these differences to say, uh, um, yes, we look at the stacks and the stacks are saying this is likely to happen or this has happened. I think, again, we lose the sight of the reality, which is we have to join together, we have to come together, we have as black people to say enough is enough. We had 20 years, or well, over 20 years of the same rhetoric. I remember, um, again, going back to what I know, which is the trade unions, over 20 years ago, when Unison was based at Transport House, and our old friend uh, Nas Malik was the chair of Unison then. I remember uh, individuals, I'm not gonna name names here because that's not, it's not about that. It's about highlighting the policy failures that, that exist. And, and that's so important to ensure that policy failure is highlighted so that lessons can be learned because that those policy failures has led us to absolutely no progress whatsoever and that's god's honest truth if you look around here i mentioned yes we got one um be uh, black person uh, or black lady has the chief executive of boundaries and we welcome that and i think that's a fantastic step forward but we've got 22 local authorities that and and you know in in, in ways there is no black person in any of those positions as a chief officer you know you look at the, um, the schools, you look at the four police force, you know, this, we had this event, I'll give another example uh, of um, Betty Campbell, the uh, head 
headmaster uh, who passed away, many of us respect her. Her daughter was on this one of these program with us. She had to go to London to get a job. My own family, so my family have to go outside Wales. Uh, graduates with degrees, they had to go outside Wales in, in England to get a job. Surely that cannot be right. You know, and we can obviously look at the differences among us and say, you know, the Bangladeshi or the black pe people have this and that and 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 I'm trying to focus and, and I think it's important for all of us to focus on the reality of, of, of what is happening with us. COVID-19 has really put a bright spotlight on all that is ill in our society. And all that is ill in our society has been nothing just rhetoric, rhetoric, and more rhetoric. And I mentioned when Unison was in a meeting with uh, Wales government ministers and responsibility for black people or black members rather, they were telling us the right stuff, they said the right words, and they want to make those changes at the time. We are 20 years later, we are still talking the same talk. So something has to be changed. And I went all the way back to when the Government of Wales Act was put together. At the center of that was to establish, because it, was, it wouldn't have been possible if, because we were protesting at the, in those days. Black people united and protest, and the protest was simple and straightforward. We have no black representation in the Wales Assembly in those days. That was the gospel and truth. We, we did not. However, we a lot of work. Yeah. Now, yes, now, yes, I'm saying I'm, I'm talking about 20 when it first started, pre, uh, uh, pre all that. And, and, no, and, 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 <laughs> it's, it's important, <laughs> honestly, uh, Savannah, it's so important to make that point that the, the equality unit of the Wales Assembly was set up purposely to advise Wales government ministers how they should pro pro progress and advance the interests of black people. Now, when that person was appointed and that person was a black person, of course, Charles really experienced the discrimination, the systemic and, and, and the systemic discrimination that is happening in the society. And when Charles really left, they replaced with someone else who have no experience of racism. And, and that person was speaking for us and they continue in that trend. The point I'm making is, it's very important for Wales government to wake up and stop rhetoric and say, okay, okay. let's go back to the origin. Okay. Let's have a black person in charge who will tell us and advise us what is correct, how they are feeling, how that is so important because we will be able to make progress, not yet again, another race equality. Sorry, I just Thank feel personal. Thank you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, it is uh, 5.57. Um, we have got um, some questions. I'm not going to be able to take them, but um, there's a, a number of them actually that were specifically for the um, Economy and Skills Minister. So what we will do is we will share those um, with him. Um, and I mean, look, there, was, there was questions um, specifically um, around uh, business, um, there was a point made by Vicky who said, Maggie made a great point about not knowing where to go for help when starting a business. What could business support, you know, you know that uh, business support could be much better in terms of engagement with the Bain communities. There was um, a question around, you know, how can we create strong, a strong group or union to influence policy change? Very much um, along the lines of what Keber has, you know, referenced as well. We've had questions over equality and diversity monitoring forms. Like, what is the point of them? We know the obstacles of, of getting an interview if yeah. the name is exotic and biased yeah. when in the interview room or with the Caucasian panel. So um, again, you know, what are we doing about these things? There's loads of questions. Um, there was a question about the fact that absolutely we need more black. Bain leaders, BME leaders in power, um, a range of specific questions for, for Ken Skates about the, um, uh, about the, uh, specifically about uh, theatres, packages um, for, um, for the creative sector, 
Again, um, the questions around engagement with BME communities. Um, there was, yeah, there was, those are the pretty much the, the types of things we were getting. Now, it is, we're not going to be able to, to get through all of those right now. But I just wanted to say a big thank you um, to um, our uh, sort of supporter organizations as well. The Henna Foundation, Women Connect First, Race Council Cymru and East, who've all, um, all done their bit to, to help promote today. Um, many of them have provided speakers. Um, Shaheen Taj, my sister actually, uh, from the Henna Foundation, big thank you to her as well for, for making sure that we had some really good speakers. Um, thank you to um, my trade union family. Um, thank you to my whole team at the Wales TUC for, 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 for making sure all the tech worked, uh, for Nizreen for, for, for doing that presentation that so many people have asked for. Um, I know that there was loads of stats in there, but it was, I think that the, the discussions that we've had today have actually helped frame and, and, you know, and for us to understand what those stats mean and why and we've had a good conversation about why they need to change. So thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, and um, I, I would normally say safe trip home, but um, enjoy the rest of your um, evenings. So thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.